Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Jim Britton, I'm with Management Advisory Group. We are a full services human resources consulting firm. We deal exclusively in the public sector, so we work primarily with government agencies that have human resources departments. Uh, over the course of the last 30 years, our senior partners and I have done almost 600 of these same, same types of studies that we're about to undertake for your school district. We work a lot with school districts, city governments, county governments. We've worked with state agencies, tribal agencies, public utility boards, airports, shipping ports. Like I said, if it's a government agency that is a human resources department, they are potential clients of ours. Here in this area, we've done uh, a few studies. I was the project manager for the county government. Queen Anne's County uh, did one of these projects a couple of years ago. We wrapped it up. Uh, we're currently working with uh, Wicomico County and uh, we also did a study for Accomac, which is uh, pretty local as well. So uh, we feel that we have our finger on the pulse and that uh, over the last 30 years, we've built a reputation of knowing how to perform and complete these studies in a timely fashion with a successful product. So before you leave today, I wanna to make sure that you understand what it is that the school district hopes to accomplish as a result of undertaking this process. We'll talk about what your role as employees is and the importance of your participation. We'll also look at the role of supervisors and we'll make sure that we understand what it is our company is going to ask of them. And uh, we'll take an in-depth look at a tool that we're going to ask you to interact with, the job analysis questionnaire. And we will also look at next steps. Now, I'm a former high school science teacher, so standing up here and talking at you for 50 minutes is not my style. I understand that uh, our attention spans as adults isn't we like to think it's a lot better than our high school students but I know from personal experience that there's no way I'm gonna remember a question for 50 minutes so I will pause often and frequently to ask if there are any questions if you find that the length of time between pauses is too long feel free to interrupt like I said I'm a former teacher so I'm used to interruptions so with that in mind, uh, just a warning, I do like to use a little bit of humor, so feel free to laugh, feel free to moan, save the boos and the hisses for afterwards, please. So with that, the project. Queen Anne's County Schools seeks to conduct a comprehensive classification and compensations study for approximately 350 positions, which cover your certified administrative and non-certified staff. We'll also put together a teacher salary survey set of recommendations based on uh, the local market as well. Now, unless your background is in human resources, it probably sounded a lot like Charlie Brown's teacher while talking about this slide. So let me dissect this, uh, dissect, never mind. Let me dissect this a little further for you. So let's talk about what the project is designed to do. Essentially, the school district wants to make sure that salaries are competitive when it comes to what they are offering employees in the district. So we're gonna gather a lot of job data from employees. We're gonna ask you to tell us in detail about the work that you do so that we can better understand that. We want to, uh, of course, ensure internal equity is uh, taken into consideration when we're talking about this type of study. And internal equity issues are typically along one of two different lines. We talked about classification in the, last in the last study, but in very simplistic, probably over simplistic terms, but it's easy to understand. We wanna make sure that everyone is properly classified, which means that the work they're doing is similar to others that have the same job title as them. So we're gonna ask employees to fill out questionnaires about the work that they do. We'll take those questionnaires back. We'll sort them according to job title. Now in a perfect world where everyone is properly classified, everyone who has that job title will report that they're doing similar work. Now the names of the reports, or the people that they report to, or the building that they work in might be different, but it's essentially the same work. When there's a classification issue, we'll notice that most of the people are doing that work, but there'll be a few stragglers over in left field that are just, they may be doing completely something completely different. They may be supervising some of the people that are doing that work or other issues. Those folks deserve to be reclassified. They, did, they deserve to have their job title changed to reflect the work that they do. Uh, the second big issue in terms of internal equity has to do with what we call wage compression. Wage compression occurs in the public sector primarily when we're coming out of a period of economic downturn. For example, during the last recession, one of our clients was hit really hard, and for seven years, they were unable to support any salary increases. So if an employee was hired seven years ago, they're making today what they made on day one. 
Well, fast forward to this day and age, the economy in that area is thawing out, tax dollars are starting to flow in, and the citizens are demanding more and timelier services. So our clients under pressure to hire new folks. So they go out, they hire people, they bring them in. Now they have people that have been working there for 15 minutes who are making as much as someone who's been there for f seven years. Now, no one thinks that's fair, and it's one of the reasons why the client wanted the study done was so that we could offer recommendations on how to alleviate wage compression, how to eliminate that issue. So that's, those are internal equity issues. Uh, but above and beyond that, making sure employees are paid fairly and competitively, we're also going to look at what we consider the external market. Now typically, the external market is divided into two categories, peers and competitors. Competitors will be the neighboring districts that you're looking at, but above and beyond that, it may also include the county itself, because once you get outside of the instructional positions, a lot of the jobs that you have here at the school district can also be found at the city level. We're talking about office support staff, building maintenance, uh, administrative functions. Those can be found at the city level, they can be found at the county level, both here within this county, neighboring counties as well. So when we're designing surveys, we like to include a smattering of those. Now, I can't speak the specifics as to who is going to be in the survey. I'm not part of that team, but our company is working with your HR leadership to put together a list of those competitors. But we also like to include peers. Now, peers would be similar sized school districts from around the region because for not every job in the school district, you also want to include peers so that you can get an idea of what the rates are in other areas should you decide to recruit from beyond the local area for some jobs. So we like to include peers in a typical survey as well. And we'll compare your salary structure here to what the market is offering because you do want to be competitive. If you're not competitive, then you run into issues of retention and recruiting. So in terms of recruiting, if you're not competitive with, the, with what the market is offering, you're gonna have a difficult time getting people to apply here for new positions. The best and the brightest will follow the money. You may find a warm body eventually, but it won't be the best candidate if you're not competitive with regards to what salaries are being offered in terms of the market. Additionally, you may have a hard time keeping employees here if you're not competitive as well. So it doesn't take much once an employee discovers that they can get paid so many thousand dollars more and drive 15 minutes less or 15 minutes more, it becomes extremely difficult to keep those folks here. So the school district wants to be competitive in terms of salary to be able to recruit great people and to retain excellent employees once they get here. So we'll identify any market adjustments that may be needed to the market plan, to the current salary structure, and make recommendations to the school district as to how to overcome those challenges. We also want to support uh, Queen Anne County Schools compensation policy that you want to be competitive to be able to recruit, retain, and manage an effective and uh, efficient workforce. We uh, will provide an implementation plan to the school district and that will be a series of those recommendations on how to get from where you're at now to making sure folks are getting paid fairly or competitively. Now, when we're talking about fair or competitive, we're not talking about making it affordable by lowering those expectations. We're talking about making it affordable by offering a roadmap on how to get from where you're at now to where you should be. That may take a period of one or two or three or more years to get there. So instead of trying to you know, swallow the elephant in one bite, you can take it a chunk at a time to get from where you're at now to where you should be to be in a competitive position. And then we'll also provide software and training in the use of software to your human resources department so that it, when you adopt our proposed pay plan, in the future, if a district manager or the, the superintendent comes forward and says, we need to create a new director of fill in the blank. Uh, with that new pay plan and use of the software, you'll be able to look and rank that position and f determine where it should fit into that pay plan so that in three or four years after a lot of jobs have been created or consolidated that the, the pay plan still has integrity so that it doesn't fall apart in the future. So that's what the, the project is designed to do. Let's talk about why we're not here. First and foremost, we need to lower expectations. Sometimes employees, when they hear the idea that there's going to be a compensation study, get the idea they're like little kids on Christmas morning with visions of wheelbarrows of money circling in their heads. So we want to dampen the expectation of everyone's going to get a raise because 
First of all, we don't know what the relationship is between the school district and the rest of the market. So we can't make recommendations at this point in that regard anyway. Second of all, of course, anytime we do make recommendations for salary increases, they may not be across the board. Some of your jobs may be perfectly in line with the rest of the market, but other jobs may need adjustment. And if we do make recommendations for adjustments, that becomes a budget issue. And of course, your budget has to be able to support any changes with regards to budget or salary. Uh, and then lastly, you have the additional, uh, rec the additional uh, fact that you're dealing with collective bargaining units. So you'll have to negotiate those to make sure that uh, if we make recommendations for increases or staying the same, that those are agreed upon by your collective bargaining units. We're also not here, we want to take this off the table, we're not here to do a staffing study. So we're not here to go into the different departments, look at the work that's being done and make recommendations to how many people are needed to do that work. We will often go into these presentations with clients and the employees will feel that this is part or the initial part of a reduction in force. We just want to put that out there that no one in the district is talking about that. This study has nothing to do with staffing levels. We're also not here to organize or reorganize departments or functions. So we're not here to say that if you combine Department A with Department B, you can increase efficiencies by 15% and drive down costs by blah, blah, blah. We do those kinds of studies. We'd be happy to come back under an additional contract. You know, no one works for free. Uh, but that's not on the table and no one's even whispering about that type of study uh, at this point. Next, I want to assure you that we're going to ask you to fill out a questionnaire and we're going to ask you to tell us about the work that you do because it is vitally important that we understand the work that's being done in the school district. However, we're not here to cast judgment on how well we think you're doing your job. While we need to understand the work that's being done, we're not here to set off a checklist or to check on quality or any of those types of things. So we want to take that off the table as well. And then lastly, I can tell you that in the almost 600 studies we've done, the hundreds of thousands of people that have been part of this process, not once have we recommended a single salary decrease. We're not in the business of taking money away from people. Okay. And I have to give this presentation again next week in Georgia, so we're not starting now because I want to be able to make that presentation with a straight face too. So we're not here to, uh, to take away anyone's salary. So does everyone understand the goals of the study? What it is the district hopes to accomplish as a result of the study? Do you have any questions about anything I've said to this point? Okay, let's talk about your role. Now, one of the functions of the study, one of the outcomes that we make, one of the recommendations or series of recommendations that we make when we're doing these types of studies is to put together a new pay plan. So all 68 titles or so that are part of the 350 positions here will be assigned a new pay grade or on this new pay plan with brand new shiny pay grade minimums and new pay grade maximums based on what the market recommend recommends. So we'll get the market data back, it'll dictate to us what the survey or what the pay ranges and pay grades should look like. So we'll put together the new pay plan. And that's the easy part, that's data in and data out. So we take the data, we put it into our software, punch a couple of buttons, turn a couple of cranks, feed it a sausage or two. I'm kidding on that one. And out comes the new pay plan. We check it, of course, to make sure that it fits. Uh, but again, that's just data. The more challenging part, and honestly the most rewarding part of the job, is taking a look at all those 68 different job titles and making recommendations as to where those jobs should fit on the new pay plan. So this job should be in pay grade 104, this job should be in pay grade 107, so on and so forth for all 68 titles. Now, I've looked at the 68 titles that you have in this district, and just based on my experience of working with school districts, I can understand just based on title about what 98% of the work here is done by those titles. But we're not surveying for every job title. And the other job titles, those are new. I haven't seen those before, so I'm really interested in determining what those folks do. But having a general understanding of what a, a school secretary does, or what a school bookkeeper does, or what a bus driver does, or what a director of curriculum does, while that's good in a general sense, that's not good enough for what we're doing here. 
we're going to put together a customized pay plan for Queen Anne's County Schools. And in order to do that, we need to understand the work that's being done here. And that's where you come in. Okay. We need to understand the work that you do well enough to make a professional recommendation as to where your job title should fit on the new pay plan. And in order to do that, in order to understand the work that's being done here, we're going to turn to you as subject matter experts. The courts have ruled that there are two subject matter experts for every job in the United States, the employee and the supervisor for that position. So as employees, we're going to ask you to fill out a questionnaire so that you can share with us all the details you want to about the work that you do so that we understand it well enough to make a recommendation as to where that job title should fit on the new pay plan. That's your role. Okay. How many of you think you could tell me everything you will need to about your job so that we understand it over a cup of coffee? Show of hands, five minutes or less. One more time than that, how about over lunch, half an hour? I'm not buying, the budget wasn't that big. That usually gets a chuckle, you're a tough crowd. Okay. Most people tell us that they'd like an hour to an hour and a half of our undivided attention so that they can share with us everything they can about their work. Now we know you don't have time for that. I'm lucky enough to get you here for this presentation today and I'm extremely grateful for that. But we know you don't have time to sit around and spend an hour to an hour and a half on a questionnaire. So we've designed our questionnaire to be done in small chunks of time. It does take about an hour to an hour and a half to complete, but you can answer two or three questions today. You can answer a question or two tomorrow. You may blow it off on Friday because pff, it's Friday. You come back on Monday, your supervisor asks, how's that questionnaire coming? So you feel a little guilty, you answer five or six questions on Monday. It's about 20 questions long, but 14 of those are multiple choice. So for 14 of those, you'll, you can get through those relatively quickly. The other ones, we'll, we'll look at those in a little more detail, okay? So we want you to uh, put your best foot forward and tell us about the work that you do. Now the courts have also ruled that supervisors are experts, not because they want to do your job or can do your job, but they pass a value judgment on how well they think you're doing it. So we're gonna listen to their input as well. We're going to ask them to review the information that you give to us. And then if they have additional comments, they can leave those for us as a comment. But they can't change any of your answers, nor can they delete any of your answers. Now, I have to tell you, most of the time, supervisors just sign off on what employees say. But if they have to leave a comment, we do give them that opportunity. And we'll, we'll take a look at the different pages in the questionnaire as to why supervisors may leave comments. Are we good? Any questions? So, just, so we, we are studying only 12-month employees, or we are studying 10-month employees and 11-month employees? 10 month. and 11-month. The question is, are we only studying 12-month employees? And the answer is, we're studying also 10 and 11-month as well. So we were studying 350 employees in the beginning. Can we have more than that in 10-month? We have. We have, like, 600 teachers. Right. Uh, the teachers are considered so. <laughs> okay, so the 300, uh, and thank you for that question. The question is, there's over 600 teachers, how can the number be 350? The, the answer to the question is, we're doing classification and compensation for 350. For the teachers, we're not doing classification work. We're not going to ask them to fill out a questionnaire and then report back to their principal and say, you know that third grade reading teacher? They should really be a fifth grade PE teacher. That, that's not the type of thing we do. That's, that's district level because it's so, so uh, heavily influenced by state licensing and such. We're, we don't make recommendations for classification. But as far as compensation, we will do a survey for teacher salaries and put together a recommended pay plan that covers those 600 as well. That's an excellent question. And thank you for the opportunity to clarify that. I keep, I keep hearing the word market. And that, you said you can't talk about the parameters of the market? Well, I can tell you that they're going to be the neighboring school districts, may include the local county and maybe some neighboring county government positions, um, possibly you know, the city of Centerville or neighboring cities, those, those types of things. Uh, I think we're going to concentrate on the eastern shore. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're, we, we have made recommendations ultimately to see by that land, but we have included western shore. Western Shore. My geography stinks. <laughs> so we base that on distance or on touches to the, to, to the boundaries of Queen Anne's County? What, what, what parameter was used to determine which 
which neighboring districts are going to be part of the study? We like to use neighboring counties for, especially for competitors. We want to include, you know, those those areas that aren't unreasonable for employees to commute to, back and forth to. Uh, but for your peers, we'll look obviously well beyond that. But we do want to concentrate heavily on the local area market. <coughs> So define reasonable distance to travel. I uh, honestly I can't because it base, it's based on the local traffic patterns here, and I don't have that information. That's why we also rely on our local partners to to give us a list, and we make recommendations based on that as well. Okay, so uh, we have put together a job analysis questionnaire that we're going to ask employees to fill out. And it's based on, you know, what are the parameters of your job? What, what are the expectations? And it does take about an hour to an hour and a half to complete, as I mentioned. But the expectation is that you're not going to sit down and do this all at once. We are looking for 100% participation. We'd like uh, every employee as part of the district, non-teachers, every employee that's part of the district to work on a questionnaire uh, or complete a questionnaire. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone has to complete their own. We don't discourage that. but we would encourage people that have similar jobs, they do the same work and they report to the same supervisor to sit down as a team and complete the questionnaire together. And then everyone that was part of that team or part of that group, we ask for their names to be listed in section 22 so that we know who participated. Section 22 is the last section in the questionnaire. And then of course we ask supervisors to review this questionnaire and during the questionnaire period we're going to send uh, twice a week I believe is, is our current uh, standard. We send a report to your human resources department. It's broken down by department. Uh, they can turn around and use that information to send to department leaders. So we'll have a listing of all the employees and whether the person has started the questionnaire, completed the questionnaire, or had their questionnaire reviewed. So uh, department leaders can use that as a motivational tool, shall we say to increase uh, participation. So with that in mind, we're going to change gears and we're going to talk about the questionnaire itself, how to access the questionnaire. Now this presentation is being recorded. We'll make that available. That will be made available to employees, but this, the PowerPoint as well as supporting documents will also be put out there. So if you don't remember this address, and this questionnaire is live now, conceivably you could leave this presentation and go work on the questionnaire. Uh, but we want you to visit our website. And if you didn't bring note-taking material, feel free to take out your camera and take a screenshot of this address. I'll get out of the way. They say the camera adds 10 pounds, and last week was killer. <laughs> that people laugh at. So we want you to visit our website, www.maginc.org. And when you get to our page, we want you to click on the JAQ button in the bottom left corner. Don't click on salary survey. Nothing good will come of it. Okay, they're two different systems, and we want employees to click on the JAQ button. Uh, we'd like you to use Internet Explorer 11, which is the latest version. Most of your computers have already been updated to that. Uh, if you're a Macintosh user, we ask that you either use Chrome or Firefox, which can also be installed on those Apple systems. Uh, we would like you to do this at work, so that uh, you should carve out time for employees to do this at work. Once you click on the JEQ button, it brings up a list of our recent most current clients. Scroll through until you find Queens and County Schools. Don't click on Key West, Florida. We're not a travel agency. We can't take you there. So resist that urge. Click on Queen Anne's County uh, Schools. When you do, you'll be challenged for your username and your password. And in both cases, you're going to use the same set of information. It's your employee ID number. It goes in both boxes. Okay. Put that information in both boxes and then click go. And you'll be taken to our employee information page. Now, regardless of whether you sign in three times or 30 times, you'll be taken to the employee information page. What you need to do here once is to tell us who is your supervisor. Identify who your supervisor is for us. Because remember, we're we are relying on you as experts. And we know almost nothing, including who reports to whom. So we're going to ask you to tell us that. Now, another box that you could work with here is the working title. If you feel that you're one of those folks that is misclassified, that you have a job title that doesn't fit the work that you do, please tell us what your job title should be. Now, keep in mind that President, Queen, Master of the Universe, those are all taken, so you have to be a little more original. To get to the questions in the questionnaire itself, click on the main menu button at the top. When you do, it brings up a list of all the pages in the questionnaire 
about 22 of them, your goal is to get a check mark in every box. You get a check mark by visiting the page, entering the information, and here's your first takeaway. There's two takeaways from this presentation. If you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember these two takeaways. The first one is always click save. Okay? Enter the information in the page and then click save. You'll get a check mark for that page if you do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, at this point, you can still go back to those pages, even if there's a check mark there. You can go back to those pages and, and do any edits that you want. Uh, and then again, remember to click save. If you're a nonlinear thinker and you want to answer question four first, then go to question 21, have at it. Okay? These questions aren't linked to each other. The important goal is to get a check mark in every box. Another function on this page is the print all pages button. If you want a blank copy of the questionnaire, so that you say you're old school, you want to answer the questions on paper first and then put them into the computer, you can print out a blank copy of the questionnaire of this page. Or if you want a hard copy of the questionnaire after you answer all the questions, you can get a list of the questions and your answers by printing it out at this point as well. Now once you get a check mark in every one of those boxes, go ahead and click the finished button. Now it's not an I'm almost done button, it's a finished button because what that does is it locks you out of the questionnaire. You told us you were finished. You can go and look at the answers that you gave but you can't change any of them. The second thing it does is it makes your questionnaire available to your supervisor. So supervisors, you can go to page five, the subordinates page of your questionnaire and see all the people who've identified you as their supervisor. When they click finish, the finish box will be checked and you can go ahead and start reviewing their questionnaire. You're not going to get a warning or an email or a text message or an alarm at 3 o'clock in the morning telling you when an employee is finished, so you have to periodically check your subordinates page. Now the way we set this up is when you click finish, you're locked out and your questionnaire becomes available to your supervisor. They can't see your questionnaire until you click finished. We designed it this way because we didn't want with any of our clients, any supervisor turning to any employee and say, you know, you really need to change your answer to that question. By the time supervisors can see the answer, employees can't change the question anyway. Supervisors can leave a comment if they have a difference of opinion, but the, supervisor, the, the employee can't change the question at this point. Speaking of questions, do you have any? Okay, let's change gears again and look at some individual pages in the questionnaire. The first one I want to talk about is called Job Category. It's not the best fitting title in my opinion, but no one asked me my opinion. Essentially in this page we're asking you what is your role in the organization. Most people who work for the school district are going to check two, their employees. But if you're a lead worker, if you have any kind of responsibility authority, there are different levels for you all the way up to number eight, the superintendent. So find the box that best, find the button that best fits the description for your job and you'll notice at the bottom of this page there is a comment box. All of our questions have a comment box and we want comments for every page. Now some of these questions I, you may not have a comment that you need to leave or want to leave but you still have to leave a comment on every page. If you try to click save without leaving a comment it will remind you with a pop-up box reminding you that you do need to leave a comment. It can be real short. It has to be at least two characters. Now what I recommend is if you don't have anything additional to say, just type in NA and then click save. And you'll get through that page. On the peer level coworkers page, we're asking you to identify other people in the organization that have similar levels of responsibility that you have. So it may be people that work on the same team as you. It may be people that sit around the same department meetings as you those types of folks. <laughs> now we understand in an organization this size and this complex, you may not have peers. If that's the case, again, just type NA and click save. There is no wrong answer here, okay? So if you feel that someone in the organization is a peer, go ahead and let us know who that is. That gives us a feeling of, it lets us know where do you see yourself fitting in to the organization structure of the school district. The essential task page is where you will spend the majority of your time in the questionnaire. <coughs> Excuse me. So the second takeaway I want to give you is when you get to this page, before you start working on this, have all your answers ready to go. 
My recommendation is to have a Microsoft Word file open with all of the information that you need to answer this question. Because this is a web page. It's like any other web page on the internet. There is a time limit here. And what we're asking for you to report to us here can be fairly time consuming. So if you're trying to think and write and edit on this page, you may lose your work. So I'm asking you to do this in a Microsoft Word document so that you can just copy and paste it into the web page. We're asking you in the Essential Pat Task page to identify for us all of those things that take at least 5% of your time. So if you're a year-round full-time employee, those are things that take about two hours per week, okay? About 5% of your time, or about two weeks out of the year. Now, we do want you to think about the whole year because you may be responsible for a flurry of activity at the end of the budget year that you spend the rest of the year trying to forget. Well, we need you to remember it for the purpose of this study. <clears throat> and we're not looking for a laundry list of items. We're not looking for something like, I get to work at 8, I enjoy my first cup of coffee until 8.15, I talk to my supervisor until 8.30, I enjoy my second cup of coffee. That's my schedule. I'm kidding. Yours will vary. We're looking for general topics, general descriptions that describe the work that you do. And there's a limit. Most people have about 10 to 12 of those that can describe the work that you do. So again, we're not looking for a checklist of, thing, of things. Where might you find that type of information? Your existing job description. My recommendation is look at your existing job description, open up a Microsoft Word file. If there's something in your job description that describes the work that you do, feel free to copy and paste it into that Microsoft Word file for use here. If there's something in your job description that you no longer are responsible for doing, don't copy and paste it. If you're no longer responsible for doing it, we don't need to know about it. Now, if there's a task that you're doing now that isn't described on your job description, other than that, as other duties may be assigned, then please tell us what those things are as well. Write a description for that so that we can possibly update the job descriptions so that human resources have that information available. So describe for us in 10 to 12 statements all the work that you do that takes at least 5% of your time over the course of a year. And here's another restriction. You see one essential task box here. The website has many more of those. You can't fill them all up. But each one of those boxes can only hold about 512 characters, which is, I'm sorry, 256 characters, which is about three short sentences. So each one of those task statements that you copy and paste or write over need to be edited down so that they are brief and succinct. So we need you to think about what you do all year round summarize it in 10 to 12 statements, and edit those statements down to three sentences or less. That might take you longer than 10 minutes, would you say? How many of you do online banking? If you're doing online banking and you're staring at your screen for longer than 10 minutes, what does your bank do? Tells you goodbye, signs you out, logs you out, locks you out. I've heard all these, those answers. Most banks will give you a pop-up box, a warning that says, hey, click OK to continue. When you do, you're keeping that line open between your computer and theirs. We don't give you a pop-up box. We don't give you a countdown timer. We don't give you a warning. I'm your warning. I flew all the way here from Nashville to be your warning. Okay. That's why I tell you to do this in a Microsoft Word document first, because if you spend 45 minutes of your life crafting the perfect set of task statements and you click save, our server is going to ask you to log in again. You'll go back to this page and you will find nothing. So avoid the frustration. Have all your work done in a Microsoft Word file first. That way you can copy and paste the answers into the essential task box. After you get your tasks in there, we want you to rank the top five most important things you do. One is the most important thing you do. Two is the second most important thing you do, so on and so forth. Then we want you to tell us about what percentage of time you spend on each task. Now, in a perfect world, all your percentages are going to add up to 100%. Okay? However, you can set the frequency there. By default, it's set the percentage of a day. But not all of us get to do the same thing day after day after day. You may do one of those tasks 5% of the month, another task 10% of the year, and a third task 5% of the week. That's fine. You can set the frequency for each one of those. But how do you convert from percentage of a year to percentage of a day? 
This isn't high school math. This is not the time to try to remember that. Remember that high school teacher that said one of these days you're going to need, this is not that day. You do the percentages, we'll do the conversions. If after we do the conversions it comes out to like 82%, I'm not going to call human resources and say, hey, we've got a slacker here. That's a staffing study. We're not getting paid to do that. Okay? So get your percentages in there. The number one reason, there's two big reasons why we see supervisor comments on this page. The first one is the supervisor is dealing with a new employee. The new employee puts down four tasks because that's what they've been trained to do. But bless their hearts, they have no idea about the other seven that are coming at them. The supervisor can fill that information in for us. Or we're all human. You may forget to put something in there. Your supervisor thinks it's so critically important that our company needs to know about it that they fill that information in for you. Those are the two reasons why we see supervisor comments. This next page describes all the job factors that we're going to ask you to tell us about. Things that you may not have even thought are relevant to compensation for a position, but we feel that things as esoteric as how difficult is the math that you have to use on a regular basis? Is it calculus based? Is it cutting edge, designing your own algorithms based? Or is it addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. That is a factor in the job, as well as how much weight you have to carry around. Not this weight, physical demands, okay? We feel that's an important factor in the, the job as well, and as well as all of these others. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about each and every one of them because they are explained on the questionnaire, but some of these do deserve to be explained, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. This is an example of one of the multiple choice questions I wanted to talk to you about. I don't expect you to be able to read this. You will when it's in front of the screen. Uh, I do want to point out that we want you to read through the selections carefully, find the one that best describes your job, select it, leave a comment if necessary, and move on. So the multiple choice questions may not take you a great deal of time. These answers are hierarchical in nature. Most people are going to answer at a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 level. Very few are going to answer at a 9 or 10. 10 says, I formulate hypotheses, exper experimental designs, or concepts based on original research. So these folks are getting published in scientific journals. Okay, very rarely do we see that. More often than not, supervisors and employees agree on what this number should be. When there's disagreement, one party will say it's a five, the other party will say it's a six. We've done these studies enough times and have read enough questionnaires that we know that the answer that a person gives in this questionnaire is based on what were they doing before they started answering the questionnaire. So we're going to split the difference. We're going to call it a 5.5 and move on. Okay. So let's talk about education requirements. The way we want you to approach this is, what is the minimum level of education required for someone new to do the job? I'm not asking you what's on the job description. To us, that's not relevant. You're the experts. We want to hear from the experts what is the education requirements, because it may have changed over time. We're also not asking you what your background is. For example, remember I told you I used to be a high school science teacher. I quit teaching when I made an important discovery. I don't like kids. Kind of important. It usually gets a chuckle or two. I can barely tolerate my own. That's thank goodness for business trips, but I don't like kids. So the smart person I thought I was, I went ahead and got a master's degree in education administration thinking, okay, I'll become a high school principal. About halfway through that two-year program, I had another realization. I'm not a big fan of their parents either. Yeah, yeah. That's a problem. So I changed careers. So here I stand as a vice president in a human re resources consulting firm with a master's degree in education administration. I like to think it makes me a better public speaker. You may have a different opinion. Please keep that to yourself. So that's why we ask you, what is the minimum level of education required for someone new to do the job? Now we know that in a school district there are a lot of jobs that require a certificate or require a license in order to, to be able to do that job. So on this page we want you to share with us what those are as well. Now when it comes to experience, it's basically the same thing. What is the minimum level of experience required for someone new to do the job? Now if you've been a school bookkeeper here for 20 years, you can't tell us that you need 20 years of experience to be a school bookkeeper. Because when you were new to the position, you may not have had that. Most of us would not have. 
So tell us in, the, the way I like to approach this is, if you were sitting down and you were interviewing someone new to help you with your job, to take on the same job title that you have, what kind of related experience would you be looking for? That's what we're wanting on this page. Not every job requires experience, so keep that in mind as well. These two pages are different from all the others in the questionnaire and that we're in. On these two, you can select more than one answer, any and all that apply. The first one I want to talk about are unavoidable hazards. These are dangerous conditions that exist because that's the job. For example, I use this regardless of the type of client I work with, school crossing guards. Because when I say school crossing guards, everyone gets this mental image of some person who's standing outside in traffic helping make sure that students are able to cross the street in a safe fashion. So they're working outside. That's a hazard in itself. They're exposed to extremes of heat and cold and bright light and dim light and dust and mold and pollen and rainy conditions. They work around traffic and heavy machinery. So they're exposed to noxious and toxic chemicals, possibly because of car exhaust. And they may work around wildlife. And I'm not talking about the two-legged kind. See, I told you I didn't like kids, okay? So that's the job. You can't get around that. You can't change that job and, get, and eliminate those dangers because that's what they do. Now, most of us who work in office conditions, we can select none. Now, the first time I gave this presentation, an employee stood up, very first time, years ago, stood up and said, my office is always too hot in the summer, it's always too cold in the winter, and I don't know what that smell is coming from the closet, but it's been there for 30 years. Well, they really don't teach you how to handle those situations in teacher training school, so thinking quick on my feet, one of the few times in my life I managed to pull off that feet, the answer is yes, but if we moved your job to a brand new office building with proper temperature control and hardwood floors so the carpet wasn't rotting, would you still be able to do the same work? And of course the answer was yes. So those are less than optimal working conditions. They're not hazardous conditions that are a nature of the job itself. If you select any of these boxes, please give us a specific example as to why you chose that as an unavoidable hazard. The next page has to do with the Americans with Disability Act. So what are the sensory requirements? What are the physical senses that a person has to have to do your job without an assistive device and without reasonable accommodation? So for example, if you can do your job wearing eyeglasses, don't check vision. If you can do your job with a hearing aid, don't check hearing, that type of thing, because both of those are assistive devices. I note that in a lot of places we go to, there are accommodations built into the workplace. So there may be ramps instead of stairs, or people may be working at, de at uh, tables instead of desks to help those folks that are limited in their mobility. That is a reasonable accommodation. Sometimes, I, work, I do a lot of work in the border towns in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, and I'll be giving a presentation to hundreds of employees, and there may be two or three folks in the audience doing real-time translation for either the hard of hearing or folks whose first language may not be English. That's a specialized skill there, so they hire folks whose first language is not English and then provide translation services. Again, that's a reasonable accommodation for that employer. So think about those. If you select any of these boxes, again, give us specific examples because this can be used by your human resources department to update requirements for job descriptions and it can be used to put out help wanted ads as requirements in the future. So that if a requirement goes out and phone calls start coming in, if they have <laughs> specific examples, because remember, you're the experts. So they need expert information to be able to defend those types of requirements in the future. Are there any questions about anything I've talked about to this point? Okay, so with that in mind, some reminders. One, always click save. Two, have your essential tasks work done before you start working on that page. That's the only page where it's going to take you longer than 10 minutes to answer a question. If you get interrupted during one of the other pages, you will lose your work, but it's not so critically important that you can't go back and think about that one single answer that you asked. If you lose your work on essential task page, look, I don't have a lot of hair left, but if that happened to me, I'd have a lot less because I'd be pulling it out. So have that work done before you start answering that page. And then where do we go from here? The next steps. 
we have some deadlines for you. And these deadlines are set in stone because your leadership team wants numbers sooner rather than later for the next budget year. So we're gonna give you about two weeks to complete the questionnaire. You can start working on the questionnaire now, but anytime between now and Friday is a gimme. They're free days. The clock starts on Friday. We're gonna give you two weeks from Friday to complete the questionnaire. We're gonna give supervisors an additional week until June 22nd because it's been our experience. I know it's not gonna happen here, but in some places people put this off until the last minute. So you give supervisors an additional week. Again, we know it's not going to happen here. Uh, supervisors, you do not have to wait until after the 15th to begin reviewing. If you've got a go-getter employee that finishes their questionnaire next week, you can go ahead and start reviewing the questionnaire at that point. You don't have to wait until after the 15th. And second, supervisors, you don't have to wait for everyone else to finish theirs before you complete yours. You can complete your questionnaire and still do reviews. So your time frame is not dependent on others. On June 22nd, we're gonna download all the questionnaires. We're gonna shut that process off. So these deadlines are firm, set in stone, non-negotiable. On June 22nd, we're gonna download all the information into our software, sort the titles by job title to make sure that, sort the questionnaires by job title to make sure that everyone is properly classified and so that we can develop an understanding of each of the types of jobs that are being done here. Uh, and then uh, while all that is going on, we will also be doing our uh, market survey. That information will come together into a series of draft reports. We'll come back, a representative from our company will come back and meet with the department leadership, show them the recommended placements on the new pay plan, as well as the projected budget impact would be from all of our recommendations. They'll make sure all of our T's are crossed, all of our I's are dotted. We'll make, take that back, polish that draft report up into a final report, and bring that back and present that to your board. There's one more feature I wanted to add, one thing that I neglected to say. While we're looking for 100% participation, and people can work in groups, it's vitally important that if you're the only person in the school district that has your job title, it's vitally important for you to fill out a questionnaire of your own because if you don't, no one else can. And if you don't fill out a questionnaire and you're the only person in that job title, we are not going to have that information that we need to develop that deeper understanding of the work that you do. And when that project and when that report comes out, if you're not happy with the placement and you haven't done your own questionnaire, we're not going to hold the study up so that you get a second chance to do the questionnaire. So let's make sure that everyone does that now. Do you have a question, another question, sir? Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, you've been a great audience, so the fact that you took 53 minutes out of your life to send it with me, to spend it with me, leaves me grateful, leaves me humbled. I'm thankful that some of you laughed at my more lame jokes. I hope you have a great day. I look forward to reading your questionnaires. Thank you so much.